What is going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel. Back with another video. It's gonna be a garage video today, so sit down, relax. Today we're actually gonna be ranking them from my cheapest bike to my most expensive bike and say if it's worth the price or not. Uh, I don't think I've ever done it. By the way, like ever since I started YouTube, none of my stuff are like ever scripted. So I literally, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm gonna talk about and I start recording and it's kind of on the fly. So I'm kind of curious myself to see like what my thought process is gonna be about all of this when I talk about every single bike. I'm not gonna delay any longer. We'll get started right away. Also, I don't know if some of you guys know, but I changed the lighting. I actually have a lot more so that I'm gonna be adding. So hopefully the garage looks cleaner. I feel like in previous videos, it was very messy. It still kind of is. I mean, we have nine bikes crammed in one little garage over here, but uh, which is supposed to be a one car garage, by the way. It's pretty packed here. And trust me guys, I do want to move, but it is not cheap in here as I'm going to talk about a little bit in this video, actually, because we're going to be talking about the prices of these bikes, MSRP, just straight MSRP without, because you know, when you buy a vehicle or if you don't know, you have to pay tax. Sometimes dealership has like higher fees if it's like a vehicle that is more rare, for example, and more people want it, then they can charge even more fees because, you know, there's competition. So whoever pays the more usually gets it or, you know, there's usually, it's called a dealer markup pretty much. So there's stuff like that. There's of course taxes. Over here where I live, taxes can range between seven to 10% on each vehicle, which is tens of thousands of dollars when added into all of this, pretty much in the amount of paid in tax, I could have bought like a 10th or an, another like exotic motorcycle because I'm pretty sure, yeah, it's probably over like, I would say in the $40,000 in taxes that I paid just on my bikes without cards or anything. So yeah, it gets expensive. And uh, of course, living gear is very expensive too. So I would like to move somewhere that is worth it in a good area because you know, I wanna keep these bikes safe and protected in a gated secure community so if i want like a very big garage then that's going to be a lot 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 more expensive to just give you a perspective if instead of moving i can pretty much use that money to get like a lamborghini it's that much more expensive in a price difference if i move so if i stay here i can pretty much with a price difference in like rent and stuff like that i can pretty much get a lamborghini that's how much more it is monthly if I decided to move somewhere else that has a massive garage. Because ideally I would like at least a two car garage with a driveway, preferably, which in this area is insanely expensive. So yeah, without further ado, let's get started. It is pretty tight, so excuse me. And yeah, 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 I know I've done the past couple garage videos. I talked when I was talking about it. Some of you guys were complaining that I'm talking to you guys a lot. You wanna see the bikes more. So from now on, you're not gonna see my face anymore. So enjoy the bikes, I guess. Since you guys wanna see the bikes, I flipped the mic backwards so you can hear my voice clear while looking at these bikes. And yeah, I wish I had more room so I can, you know, take them out and take them out and show you like the details of every single bike and all that because I have put a lot of work and parts and money into every single bike. But we're not gonna be talking about that. That might be a future video. So for this video, we're gonna start with the KTM Super Duke. This bike, see none of the bikes also come like this. As I said, I've put a lot of money and effort and parts into them. So they're not gonna look this good, unfortunately, but still, and I might actually get the clips from my decibel video and add some startups for all these bikes for you guys because I know you always like hearing them. But starting off with the Super Duke, the Super Duke MSRP was a little over $20,000. I'm gonna be like rounding it up, up and down. So $20,000 for the KTM Super Duke over here. I think for a top motorcycle of its brand, priced a little bit high. I wouldn't say too high, I would say a little bit high. And the reason I'm saying a little bit high because you can actually get not an R1M, but you can get an R1 for I think cheaper. I think the R1s are like around $18,000. So the fact that this is about $2,000 more than an R1 makes me question if it's worth it. I personally, as a super sport type of guy, I would rather get an R1 over uh, a Super Duke, even though this is the Super Duke R Evo, which apparently the main difference is that it comes with the electronic suspension, which I've mentioned before that I actually really like. So yeah, $20,000 for the Super Duke R Evo. This is the cheapest motorcycle. It was supposed to be my daily beater, but then I actually ended up KTM surprisingly has a ton of carbon fiber 
parts and a lot of like parts in general a ton of parts that you see on this bike are actually directly through ktm as you can see right here which i kind of liked you know it's not overpriced it's actually priced cheaper than some aftermarket stuff because i learned that they make everything in-house for the ktm so value overall in general i think it's a little bit overvalued i think these should be around the 16 to 17 thousand dollars I think if the bikes are getting into the 20s, then they should be either some sort of like exotic, like BMW or Ducati, where they offer like a lot for that price, or they should be like a rare bike. So this is why I don't think the KTM is worth that much. At the end of the day, it doesn't make as much horsepower. It is a naked bike. And I don't know, the technology kind of lacks. Also, technically, if you think about it, uh, this bike should be an extra thousand dollars actually because it doesn't come with a quick shifter or anything They give you the quick shifter and all the technology But that you, you have to pay an extra thousand dollars to activate it. It's not like at all I think it's a way of KTM trying to rob people of more money I think for slightly over twenty thousand dollars It should at least come with a functioning working auto blipper and the tech that it has should at least work Not a big fan of what KTM did other than that, if I'm talking just bike in general, price aside, it is definitely a fun bike. It's like a big boy grump. That's what I would describe it as. And I definitely enjoy using it. You're gonna see my face a little bit in between. It probably sound weird because I did flip the mic the other way around. So I don't know how good the audio quality is right now, but so in last place, the KTM at $20,000. Next up, do you guys have any guesses? In the comments down below, put every single bike and rate it from cheapest to most expensive without cheating i think one a couple of the bikes definitely surprised me myself and it might surprise a lot of you guys as well all right so next one is actually not the r1m it is gonna be got to squeeze through here the aprilia rsv4 1100 factory rsv4 1100 factory aprilia's biggest and baddest that is road legal they do actually have the x trento or something like that which is a sixty thousand dollar like track bike which looks absolutely amazing i might throw a picture in here for you guys which is a bike that i would want to get maybe one day now that i'm getting bikes are crazy limited such as the h2r it is a possibility but for a street legal version this is the top the best that they make the prelude rs before 1100 factory this bike is $25,000. It's already a big jump from the KTM, $5,000 more. It does come with a functioning auto blipper quick shifter. It does not come with electronic suspension because this bike actually is supposed to be a track bike. And if you notice most track bikes such as the V4R and the M1000R, they do not have electronic suspension because apparently people like can find dial the manual suspension better or something like that and apparently it's like lighter to weight savings i don't know tell me in the comments down below if there's more to it but that's from what i've heard why a lot of these track bikes they prefer the manual over the electronic suspension it's weird because the fireblade double r s triple rsp sorry it comes with electronic suspension this is supposed to be kind of like a crazy track weapon too as well as r1m so it's kind of confusing and that's why i don't really know the probably i already think this is yeah it's five thousand dollars more but i think it's a better value than the KTM back there. The main reason is that, first of all, this bike comes with a decent amount of carbon. This is OEM carbon. This is OEM carbon right here. This side piece right here, this is OEM carbon as well. The fact that it comes with winglets, front fender, and side piece in carbon, and it's really nice, good quality carbon, straight from the factory with a working quick shifter auto blipper, and it makes a ton more horsepower than the KTM. I know horsepower isn't fair because some bikes it's not about horsepower. You know that the Aprilia is around that 215 as well as the Fireblade. They both make about the exact same horsepower right here. So yeah, $25,000. I think this is one of the best value leader bikes that you can get in my opinion. The best sounding motorcycle. It rides easy, it's smooth, it's fun. It's a crazy package. It comes with an S stabilizer. Most of these bikes do because you definitely need it so you don't get tank slappers with all the power and torque that these bikes make. An LED screen, all colorful and stuff like that. So everything is very modern and like a good value in general. But I do think that Aprilia didn't do anything like KTM where it's like, you know, the KTM needed a lot of work for it to look good. This didn't really need much. In general, this comes out of the showroom pretty good looking. I feel like if you don't want to spend as much money like I do on my bikes, the main thing you need to do is get rid of the mirrors. So you get yourself like Rizoma mirrors and a tail tidy and you're pretty much set to go. 
That's, in my opinion, of course, a tune and exhaust. Those are essentials. After that, you're pretty much good, and this bike looks beautiful and rides amazing. KTM needed a lot more visual work and uh, tuning and stuff like that to bring it back to life. So, which is why I don't think value-wise so far, this beats it for sure. Next up, not much more than this one. So $20,000, $25,000, the R1M. <laughs> coming at around $27,000. It ranges from year to year. Those two are usually about the same, but the R1M is a little bit more, about $1,000 to $2,000 more than the Aprilia over there. If I had to choose in between the two, I would probably choose the R1M, mainly because the way it looks, I wanna say the way it feels while riding. While the Aprilia might be smoother and uh, easier to ride, this is this has more character in my opinion. It's just, in my opinion also, it's one of the most beautiful bikes. You can literally get an R1M, not even change, like even the mirrors don't look that bad on this. I kept them for the longest time and then I was like, whatever, let's change them to the Rizoma Stealths since I have them on pretty much like all my bikes. And this bike comes with a ton of carbon. That's one thing I was obsessed with the R1M. I think the silver makes it look like a fighter jet. And look at those. Like that tail design was iconic when that came out. Everyone was obsessed with it. The tail is absolutely beautiful. Also one of the best sounding bikes. People can argue which one sounds better, the Aprilia RS before 1100 factory or the R1M. I do think that Aprilia might sound a tad better, just a little bit, but that could be because I'm very used to the sound of the R1M because I did have this for a couple of years or maybe even longer before I got the Aprilia over there. Of course, all of them are equipped with beautiful SC Project exhaust because they are the best sounding and full titanium. At $27,000, can you guess what the next bike is? It's the Fireblade. The Fireblade Triple RSB <laughs> is in the sixth place as the cheapest one in here in the collection coming at $29,000. So a couple thousand more than the R1M as well and about 4,000 more than the Aprilia. I think it's worth it. It's gonna be hard for me. I think like most of the bikes are actually rated correctly. The one downside about this is that it needs more carbon. I wish from factory it came with a lot of carbon like the R1M and that it came with better wheels. That's one big downside that a lot of people compare, complain about is that these are actually cast wheels. If you don't know what that means, that means they're pretty much insanely heavy. So most of these, other bikes, especially the premium bikes, except the Ducati, because I did buy forged carbon fiber wheels are aftermarket, so disregard that. But even the OEM wheels for this were forged. So most of these like higher end bikes come with like lighter forged wheels. The Fireblade did not, and since it's a $30,000 pretty much track bike, I feel like it should have came with lighter wheels. Some carbon would have been nice as well. Besides that, I think this is my most OEM looking bike. It's just stunning out of the box. Now, I would say when I was buying it, I was in between this one and the white one. At that time, I've only seen the white one in pictures and I didn't think it looked good. The pictures didn't do it justice. So I went with this one because it represents Honda more with the Honda racing colors. I got this one. I recently saw a white one and low key, I like the white one better. So unfortunately, it would be too much work to swap it out because I did spend a lot of money on this. This bike has a full system exhaust. The Prilia had a three quarter. This just has a slip on, doesn't even have three quarters, still has the cats. The massive ones right there, if you can see them, right there, which is why it's not as loud as the other ones. This one does have a three quarter. Oh, fun fact also, the R1M came with titanium headers from factory. The new ones don't anymore but this generation, they came with titanium headers from factory, so now technically has a full titanium system. This one, if you guys don't remember, this is my loudest bike in the collection, surprisingly. Kind of surprisingly, given that I have an H2 and H2R and a lot of ton of other crazy loud bikes, such as the Aprilia as well. This does have a full system exhaust. I don't know what else I've done to it. It's more accessories than big like parts. Like most of my other bikes, I do a lot of ton of carbon, like my M1000, a ton of titanium bolts everywhere that I'll show you guys when we talk about this bike. This one's mainly like minor stuff such as like a chain adjuster, like frame uh, axle sliders. We got rear sets for it. Most of them have aftermarket seats, custom ones. Besides the Aprilia actually, that's the only one that I kept OEM because it didn't look bad and it kind of matches the black look. I didn't know what color I would want to do. 
I was thinking about like a little bit of red since it has a little bit of red, but I kind of like the stealth look. Yeah, the fire blade, not too much stuff, you know, like levers, lever guards, uh, grips, a bunch of like little accessories everywhere, like quick release gas cap, nothing major like the other fights besides the work that was put into the performance mods, such as the full system, velocity stacks. Do I think this bike is worth the price tag? Absolutely. It's one of my favorite riding motorcycles. I don't know what about it, but it's just such a thrill to ride every time. And I can, I feel like you can never get over it. It's just really fun. It looks absolutely beautiful and menacing and it's just a joy to ride. So I definitely think, and it's build quality is really well made and it just feels like a premium motorcycle when you get one. Plus it is rare, it is limited. This is the triple RSP, you guys. By the way, in the US, we do not have. A lot of you guys are gonna be like, oh no, this is not limited, this is not rare because there is a regular double R and then the, the then I mean triple R and then there's the triple R SP. We do not get the regular triple R's, we only get this SP. So if we wanna get triple R, it has to be the rare limited model. Same with the BMW M1000 double R. We only get the competition packages. We don't get the base ones. So that's why all of these bikes, when we talk about it, you're gonna see that this is a lot more expensive than you guys would think because this is the competition package. Similar thing with the Rush, which I'll, we'll get to when we get to these bikes. Any guesses which bike is gonna rank fifth? So number nine, number eight, no, number nine, number eight, number seven, number six at 29,000, and just a smidge over at $1,000 more, you get the beautiful Kawasaki Ninja H2. You guys know me, I am the Ninja H2 guy, the Kawasaki guy, so this is my absolute favorite, and in my opinion, for the price that it sells, it is absolutely insane. Best value, in my opinion. For that price, I would definitely get that and not anything else that we just talked about in here. This is just an engineering marvel. I'm obsessed with it, you guys know me. It, clearly, it's the only bike that I have technically two of, an H2 and the almighty H2R. I don't think I need to talk much about it. In my opinion, Kawasaki could have sold this bike for $50,000 and still a lot of people would get it. But I guess that's why they make this one, which is even more than 50, so. Worth the money is just, and the experience, the sound, the supercharger, the feel, everything about it is crazy. Obviously, it's not like a Canyon track bike, whatever. But if you want a pure experience type of ride, this is the bike. I'm a little biased because, you know, I love the H2s. It's H2s and the H2Rs are actually what got me into more cycles. At the Kawasaki booth, they had an H2 and stuff like that. It was my first time ever seeing them until I ended up getting one. But never seen one in the road until I got one. H2 is the fifth. Number four, we're getting close to the top three, is actually the BMW M1000 R, and the price went up crazy. <laughs> Between this and this. This is $38,000. As we were saying, I think the European edition is at like 33, maybe, I think $33,000. And then for an extra like $5,000, it's like comp the competition package, which comes with like all the carbon. And as far as I know, carbon, I don't know if it comes with other stuff, but you know, this bike comes from factory with carbon fiber wheels. It's the only one besides I think if you get the SP models of the V4, which in my opinion is absolutely insane, which makes the deal a lot more worth it because even if you get aftermarket ones, it's gonna be at least about $5,000 for a carbon fiber wheel set. So there's that extra money for you on top of the H2. So BMW has the best technology, in my opinion, the most well put together bikes, uh, a lot easier to work on than, for example, the Ducatis and some of the other bikes. Not as easy as some of the Japanese bikes, but still one of the easiest bikes to work with. Uh, just tons of features, electronics, premium build quality parts. It's just a well-finished motorcycle. You know, this is one of the bikes that you spend a lot of money on. And when you get it, you're like, I get why this is expensive because it's made to perfection. You know, everyone knows German engineering. Of course, this is, also a bike with a full system exhaust, full titanium exhaust. And I've spent way too much money on these titanium bolts. It's almost full carbon. I just kept some of the white to represent the M because I feel like if I went full carbon, even if I put the sticker, it's gonna look more like an S because most people actually don't know that there's an M1000 blur. So 
There's an S1000RR, S1000RR M package, and an M1000RR, which is a different engine, K66 engine, titanium internals, revs faster, less top speed, but faster revving, and they should make a little bit more horsepower as well. So, number four, the M1000RR. I think it's a little bit expensive when you compare it, for example, to the H2, but also get it, you know, you get carbon wheels, you're getting a lot of stuff when you get this bike, you know, the technology and all of that. At the end of the day, the H2 is pretty basic when it comes to the technology, but it's not about that, you know, it's about something completely different. But the fact that this is $8,000 more than that, eh, personally, if I had to choose one and I had, let's say $40,000, I would still choose this and spend the other 10 in modifying it. That's what I would do. Slightly above this motorcycle, the Panigale V4R. Now this is a very unfair comparison because my Panigale V4R is actually my most expensive in the collection because I've spent the most amount of money on it. Almost everything you see on this bike is custom or is going to be. But most of it right now is custom. This bike is my most expensive in the collection. Arguably, this is the most beautiful motorcycle in the collection and Ducatis in general are the most beautiful. Complete works of art. This motorcycle actually comes in at $40,000. This has a super Leggera engine. At the time we didn't know because the V4 Super Leggera wasn't made. The top of the line Ducati was the V4R. And then they came out with the Super Leggera, which pretty much shares the same engine as the bike. So the fact that this has a Super Leggera engine has a clear uh, dry clutch, which if you want to convert from a wet clutch to a dry clutch, which this has, it's about $5,000 to get the parts and to get the job done because it is a big job. So $5,000 here, it's a complete different engine, which is a super legit engine, which is a thousand cc's by the way, making like 220 something horsepower, 225 I believe or something like that. Ridiculous numbers. In my opinion, it is one of my fastest bikes besides of course, the H2 and the H2R, but it actually somewhat compares to them because of how light it is. At the end of the day, like the H2 and the H2R are very heavy, so it does make you feel a bit slower. This just flies, that's how it feels like. It's extremely powerful, but also extremely light, so it just like, it's gone, just like that. Do I think the V4R is worth $40,000? Absolutely, yes. If I had to choose between this and the M1000, because they're about the similar price, I would most likely go for this. As I've said before, this is my favorite bike to ride. I think it's the most fun with top-notch technology as well. I think the BMW does beat it in the technology aspect a little bit, but this is a close second when it comes to that. I absolutely love the Ducatis, especially the V4R. Again, I've talked about wanting to get another SV or a Super Leggera because I'm just obsessed with Ducatis. If I can only have two brands, it would probably be Kawasaki and Ducati, and I would probably have these two bikes right here. Or possibly, you know, the h and the V4R, because the R's. $40,000, absolutely love this bike and in my opinion, it's totally worth the price. I don't know if it's worth it over the S, especially if you're doing mainly street riding, but it does feel better in my opinion because this is $10,000 more than the S. The S is coming around like 28, 30, so it's a lot cheaper. It's more on the Fireblade price range, which is more than enough, but when you get into that $1,000 or the V4R, like that price range, these bikes are actually elevated. They do feel different, it's not just Oh, here, pay a ton more for, you know, carbon wheels or something like that. So they do feel different. They have different engines and they do ride different. Is it optimal for street riding? Probably not. If it's my only bike, I probably wouldn't want this. But you guys know me, I like crazy bikes and this is a crazy bike. That's why I'm obsessed with it. Third place. So what's left? We have the Rush over there, surprisingly. And we have this bike right here, the H2R obviously. The most expensive naked bike as far as I know. This bike is $45,000. When you start this bike, it literally says on the dash motorcycle art, and that's what this bike is. So the European models, I believe, they have a $40,000 version, and then you pay an extra $5,000 to get this crate back here under all of this stuff. And this crate gives you the SC Projects slip-on exhaust, I did make a custom mid muffler for this. If you guys missed that, make sure you check out that video to straight pipe it. So now it is a straight piped bike. It does come with like these front rotors with levers 
and a few other accessories that I forgot about, but you know, basic stuff like that for an extra $5,000. The fact that it comes with the exhaust definitely makes it a little more worth it. Oh, it does come with the quick release gas cap. So as I said, $45,000, but we don't have the option. If you want to rush, you have to get the $45,000 option with the crate and all the stuff, which I'm not mad about, but $45,000, as I said, before is $40,000. If you're a collector getting this bike to look at it, ride it once in a blue moon, amazing, perfect. The bike is absolutely worth it. It's a work of art. It is numbered. This is number 124 out of 300. A very cool, unique feel when you have a numbered bike, especially when there is only 300 of them. It also has it on the carbon wheel hub cover. Also, this is such a beautiful, unique design. One of my favorite features about this bike is the carbon wheel cover. Apparently it's for aer aerodynamics, which makes sense, but I think they mainly did it for the beauty of it, because at the end of the day, this is not a bike that is designed to go fast, even though it can. This bike has hit 200 miles an hour, believe it or not, 320 maybe kilometers, something like that. So this is a very fast bike, do not underestimate it. It can pull and get to high speeds, but it's not gonna be the smoothest. It's not gonna give you the best feel. At the end of the day, it is what they state it is. It is motorcycle art. This is the guy that put this bike together, actually. They give you the name of it, and you get a lot of other stuff in this crate, such as like a certificate of all the people that worked on it, and a plaque and stuff like that. So it is an experience. It's a beautiful bike, a collectible, and also it does sound absolutely beautiful. I'm not completely mad about the price tag. Personally, I would spend this type of money on it unless I was obsessed with like Envy Agusta or the bike specifically and naked bikes were my thing and I wanted a very cool pretty naked bike and I had let's say like another couple naked bikes and I was like now I want like a collectible something that is cool crazy fun that I can ride every once in a while then sure go for it for $45,000 I can't say it's overvalued because that's what I like about MV is that they do say this is motorcycle art and I'll give it to them. This is a work of art. It is, I think, one of the best put together motorcycles. The way it's designed and parts and like premium quality. And definitely that is their main priority and it shows. There's not much plastics. There's not much poor quality parts on this bike. Almost everything feels premium and looks premium, which is the point. The only thing that is not premium is the riding experience. It's fun, as I said, every once in a while, but to always ride it, it wouldn't be my first choice. So that's why it's to spend that much money on a bike that you're just gonna look at is also questionable. So I'll leave it up to your interpretation if this bike is worth that much or if not. But of course, the fact that it is as rare as it is, it also boosts up the value for it. For the number one, first place, obviously. <laughs> My favorite bike i guess i can say that i i can say that about a lot of my bikes but this is like the childhood dream this is what kind of like got me into motorcycles when i was like 19 years old and that's when i got my first motorcycle and i just wanted a motorcycle for the hell of it i got a motorcycle and i was like okay i'm obsessed with this this is awesome and i started looking up videos and stuff like that and when i learned about the h2 and the h2r that's when i was like truly obsessed and i never thought i would own an h2r i always knew that i would own an h2 one day because it's half the price of this. This is a $60,000 bike. So $15,000 more than the second place, the Rush over there. So by far my most expensive motorcycle, which is actually still cheaper than this one because this is a lot more after all the work I've done to it. So, but I have done a lot of work on this one as well, which we're not gonna talk about much, but you know, ton more carbon fiber added it does come with a lot of carbon fiber but but yeah sixty thousand dollars this is a track only bike supposedly at least it does not have headlights it doesn't come with mirrors at all it comes directly with these wings which i bought the h2r wings on my h2 up there and down here this bike does not have fans either i'll try to show you right here i don't know if you can yep there you go see no fans over here so the bike does run hot which i've complained about before but the cool thing about it thank you kawasaki for doing this the h2 fans are compatible they literally have holes here so all i have to do is 
get the H2 fans bolted, it's already in the ECU, so automatically start working. So that's the plan for this thing after this winter, because hopefully in this winter it's gonna be running cool anyways. But after that, I'll definitely be adding those. I won't be adding any headlights, I just won't ride the bike at night. It does come with a full titanium exhaust. So you guys, but you can still see the pipes right here. This is all OEM H2R. Since it's a track race bike, it does come with that directly, which, you know, of course, adds to the value of it. But of course, the main feature about this masterpiece of a motorcycle is the horsepower. This is rated at 330 horsepower. We did put it on the dyno and made 275 to the wheel, which a lot of you guys are getting confused with. They're like, how can you say it's 300 plus horsepower? Because it made 275. Guys, 275 to the wheel is different than crank. Kawasaki never claimed that it makes 330 to the wheel. They claimed 330 to crank made 275 wheel if you just literally google conversion of 275 wheel to uh, to crank horsepower it's going to come up to around that 330 mark now i would say that it made 275 after we tuned it so before we tuned it, it was around the 250 so technically it was barely at that 300 horsepower before the tune but after the tune it is it did go up to that 330 horsepower mark that it claimed. That's the main, main thing about it. You can see the air intake on this bike directly to the supercharger. It does have a different design from the H2. The air intake is both holes up here. So you can see it right here. And also on the other side, air goes in from both and it's right through this tube and goes directly to the massive supercharger right here. And the H2 on the other hand, if you can see, one of these is blocked, only one of these takes the air and then the air filter is actually not in the front like this one. The air filter would be right here, a lot smaller, so a lot less air for the H2 than the H2R. Uh, this one did make 250 to the wheel, but also that was on a different dyno. So for now we're going to stick with 250, 275 to the wheel, even though this feels like more than 275 to the wheel. It is also a ton lighter than the H2. I will need to buy a scale and test that again, just to make sure that this is accurate as well, because this is at 325 pounds or something like that. And this is at 275. Obviously after a ton of work, this does have a full system. So it is a lot lighter and a ton more carbon in other parts, but also I've made this one a lot lighter too with a ton of titanium, green titanium bolts, major parts such as like suspension links, over here and a ton of like expensive major bolts that end up saving a lot of weight, lithium batteries and all type of other full carbon fiber stuff frame right here. So a lot of stuff that should make this around that 460 range, which is pretty significant for a motorcycle, especially a motorcycle that is this powerful. It's time now to switch the mic again because I did show you the bikes that you wanna see the bike while I'm talking about them instead of me. So I did that for you guys. Now, I, I believe the total for all of them before tax just based on MSRP, what you look up online is three, a little over, like $320,000, I believe, for all of these, which is technically the price of like one really nice Lamborghini. What would you take? Would you take one nice Lamb? Not an Aventador, or nice, not an STO. Those are more expensive, but would you like this entire collection or would you like one Huracan? Well, yeah, technically. After tax, they should be around that $350,000 range. Of course, there's other stuff such as, as I said, like fees. There's also uh, registration fees that I have to pay yearly, which I've talked about in one of the videos. Uh, and of course, insurance is really expensive. So there's a lot of other stuff that you have to account for and pay for. This is my passion. This is These are my big boy toys that I love and enjoy, and I hope you guys enjoy them too. Of course, besides the crazy amount of money I've spent in parts, which one day will do, a lot of money was spent on these. So please make sure you drop a like and subscribe. We're getting very close to a million and hopefully this video does well because you guys do like the garage videos. And let me know if you'd like to see more. There's a lot of videos that I can film and talk about in here, such as part breakdowns, talking about insurance costs here, how you can save some money on insurance maybe because I've been doing this for a little bit of time now. So I know a couple tricks here and there, give you guys some tips and stuff like that. So as I said, please drop a like, subscribe and let me know down in the comments below what else would you like to see in a garage video 
And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this. My voice is gone. I've been talking consistently for over, I don't even know how long this video is, but I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out, ride safe. I hope you enjoyed it.